to the first PCRM EPA PETA um, co-organized webinar on the use of NAMS in risk assessment, which I'm hoping from here on will be called the PEP webinars. So um, I just want to give a, a minute or two history of how this came about and then hand it over to Amy to introduce the speakers and begin the presentations. So back in um, March of 18 at the S, uh, March of this year at the SOT meeting in San Antonio, um, Amy Clippinger and Chrissy Sullivan and Esther Hagebrooks met with uh, uh, William Irwin, Keith Jacobs, and myself to talk about NAMS in general, the impending strategic plan, and some plans, especially around um, training and educating um, uh, the public stakeholders and regulators. And so that was the beginning of the thinking. And then after the strategic plan was posted in June, we had a few more discussions and calls and agreed to have this uh, regular webinar series and um, we also uh, had the idea of um, uh, the first one being around the uh, April 2018 OCSPP interim policy on skin sensitization. And um, we're, we're thankful that Chrissy and Amy were able to get um, representatives from the two organizations that developed the two defined approaches that are uh, spelled out in our draft policy, COW and BASF. So um, we're, we're really uh, fortunate to have them. And our second request was that this first one be internal only, which would allow the EPA scientists to interact directly with the developers of these two um, approaches. And so we're really grateful that this first one, you accommodated our request to be, it, uh, to be um, internal. I think it's safe to say that from this point on, they're all going to be public. Um, and so, uh, and I know uh, Amy's going to speak a little bit about the recording part. I would like to also thank our OPP colleagues, and I see a few of the names uh, that are listed in the attendees. And we have a room here full of Six, six of us also listening, even though it only lists us as a single point. So um, with that as an introduction, Amy, I'd like to turn it over to you. Great. Thanks, Gino. Um, as Gino said, my name is Amy Klippinger. I direct the PETA International Science Consortium. And I'll just be running through a few really brief logistics and, and introducing our speakers. We do have the two speakers today presenting on skin sensitization, uh, Dr. Susanna Kale from BASF and Taku Nishijo from Cal Corporation. Um, before I introduce our first speaker though, um, I wanted to point out that slides from today's webinar can be found online at the link on the screen. They will also be posted on the EPA's website, but that site is currently under construction. So um, once that's up, We'll, we'll post them there as well. And then after today's webinar, we'll post a recording too. So if you want to go back and listen to it or share it with any of your colleagues who weren't able to attend live today, uh, please do so. Um, only the presentation portion of this webinar will be recorded. And then following the presentations, there'll be time for discussion and questions and, and that part won't be recorded. So no one needs to be, feel shy about speaking up. Uh, during the presentations, please mute yourself, um, and I think with that, we'll go ahead and, and get started. So speaking first today is Dr. Susanna Kale. Um, she obtained her PhD in biotechnology from the University of Heidelberg in Germany. Since 2009, Susanna has headed up BASF's laboratory for tissue toxicology, primarily conducting alternative methods for eye irritation and skin sensitization. And today she'll be presenting on BASF's uh, two out of three approach for in vitro skin sensitization testing. So Susanna, I've just made you the presenter and you can go ahead then and get started whenever you're ready. Thank you very much, Amy. Um, thank you very much also for the uh, kind introduction and also the opportunity to uh, present the two out of three 
um, approach to the group. Um, so I'll have a bunch of uh, introductory slides, uh, which I will walk you through, um, and then I will then discuss also um, some details and limitations of the methods um, from which the two out of three approach is composed, um, and also discuss some um, OECD activities on the regulatory acceptance and, and mutual acceptance of data of the um, defined approaches. So getting you started um, on skin sensitization, um, it's actually um, the allergic contact dermatitis, which is the clinical manifestation of a skin sensitization. Um, and as shown in the picture, um, you, it's recognized as swelling and redness, and it's usually an itching kind of inflammatory response. Um, this, those hypersensitive reactions occur only after repeated exposure to an allergen. Um, so a single exposure is not sufficient um, since we need the challenge of the uh, immune system. And it is known that about 15 to 20 percent of the general population is uh, sensitized to something. The most common allergic contact dermatitis is nickel. Um, since most of the sensitization activities started out in Europe, um, I thought I'd also mention a few words about REACH, which is the European Chemicals Legislation. Uh, and actually, the um, information requirement under REACH has been updated in 2017. So before that, uh, the standard information requirement was the local lymph node assay conducted at the mouth, uh, but in 2017, um, the in vitro and in chemical assays that you will uh, see in the following slides um, have been added here as the standard information requirement. And well, and this will also follow in, in later slides. Um, animal tests that shall no longer be conducted unless um, there is sufficient evidence that the in vitro information is not sufficient. Um, so next, I'd like to, if my slides would move. So oh, here we go. Um, so in the next uh, three or four slides, I'd like to walk you through the mechanism of skin sensitization so it's easier to follow the methods uh, along the adverse outcome pathway. Um, so in this graph, you have a scheme of the skin. You have the stratum corneum, which is the dead, dead layers of the skin. Um, and below that, there's the epidermis, um, which has keratinocytes and also some dendritic cells. Um, that's the immune cells of the skin. Um, the red dots uh, that will also be uh, representing the haptens in, in the next slide are um, yeah, above the skin. So if we now look at the first um, event in the adverse outcome pathway, that's the molecular initiating event. Um, that's the haptenization of, this, of the um, a con potential contact sensitizer to the skin. Um, so once the substance has penetrated and reached the viable layers of the skin, it must bind to skin protein to um, elicit this, the skin um, sensitization. And then in, in the next step, that's the um, key event two. Um, you can see the keratinocytes being being activated and uh, those um, then exert um, danger, danger signals. Um, following that, in, a, in the third key event, uh, we have the dendritic cells um, that are activated by the contact to the haptin uh, skin complex and the morphology and the yeah, um, changes of the, of the dendritic cells. Um, so the, the cell surface markers um, are being expressed as well as cytokines released. So um, skin sensitization is a pretty well understood um, process and it has been published in the, um, as an adverse outcome pathway uh, by OECD a few years ago. Um, so and that's breaking down um, the initial events um, which can then be addressed by individual methods. So we have uh, chemical structures and properties that determine whether a substance can uh, can penetrate the skin or whether a metabolism needs to um, alter the substance. Um, then there we have electrophilicity determining um, how well the um, compound would bind um, to, to skin protein, followed by the covalent 
binding to the skin protein, which is the molecular initiating event. And then we have cellular responses of the dendritic cells as well as the keratinocytes. Um, and that's where th this is the uh, points where the in vitro methods stop um, organ responses. Uh, such as in the lymph nodes and also organism responses in the skin um, can currently not be assessed in vitro by regulatory accepted methods. So um, as of today, there is several in vitro test method guidelines for skin sensitization. That's um, the 442 series, so it's the DPRA, um, the um, antioxidant response element essays um, as well as the essays addressing the third key event, so dendritic cell activation in the AOP. And next we will look into the methods in, in, in more detail. So the DPRA, um, the direct peptide reactivity assay that was initially developed by, um, by Proctor and Gamble is an chemical assay. Um, it uses synthetic peptides. One is containing a cysteine moiety, the other one a lysine moiety, that are incubated with a test substance at a fixed ratio um, for 24 hours at around about room temperature. And then using an HPLC method, it is determined how much of the um, peptide is depleted, um, or in, in reciprocal terms, uh, how, how much is, is remaining. Um, then a mean value of the cysteine and lysine peptide depletion determines, um, and then there is a cutoff, a statistically de determined cutoff value um, that discriminates between negative and positive results. Um, the DPRA um, is not applicable for substances that are metals. Um, that's for the um, that due to the fact that metals react by a different uh, mechanism. So they, um, they do not bind to cysteine to ly and lysine, but by coordination forms. So metals are out of the domain of this assay. Um, and then there's another limitation, which is the solubility. So um, in the DPRA, test substances are um, made at a stock concentration of 100 millimolar. And if something is not soluble at that concentration, and also then um, in the mixture with a peptide, um, there's always a, a, the risk of um, underestimating reactivity if a negative result is obtained in, in the assay. Um, the assay is technically applicable to mixtures. However, um, the, the, the prediction model is made on a molar ratio. Um, so um, also substances uh, like UVCBs or other mixtures of unknown or variable composition um, are difficult to test or may be difficult to test because we cannot test them according to a molar ratio and a different prediction model may, may be used. Um, a similar limitation applies to polymers. Uh, however, the guideline also states that they can be tested according to their predominant molecular weight or uh, according to the molecular weight of a mono monomer, and it always helps to um, test these mixture type of substances undiluted as uh, something like a worst case scenario. Um, then also uh, mentioning the deeper is in, in chemical assay um, also means that it does not have a metabolic capacity. However, um, in one of the latest slides, I have the references. Um, it has been shown that the majority of the pre and pro hub tens um, are sufficiently well identified in, in this assay. So next, we'll, we'll look at the antioxidant response um, on the F2 luciferase, luciferase test methods, um, which are cell-based assays. Um, so that's the lucens and the keratinosense assays. So both assays use a keratinocyte cell line that's genetically modified um, to, to have this antioxidant response element um, with a luciferase reporter. Uh, and once we have a substance that's activating the pathway, um, we can measure the lu uh, luminescence of the luciferase reaction. Um, the, this um, assays are applicable to soluble test substances, but also to those that form 
stable dispersions, either in water or in DMSO. Um, and what is mentioned here in gray um, is that, uh, well, previously there was a limitation with the log P. Um, above seven should not be tested in the, in the guideline, but that was removed in the latest revision of the guideline. So um, the log POV or log P is not a limitation any longer. Um, however, if we have a negative result, um, uh, yeah, um, so we, the maximum concentration tested is 2,000 micromolar, um, but yeah, it may, if we have a negative here um, below that concentration, um, that should be uh, considered inconclusive if no cytotoxicity is observed. The mechanism of the antioxidant response element also um, yeah, includes some cysteine reactivity, hence uh, substances that are primarily reactive towards lysine may, may not be detected reliably in this assay. Also, um, the cells or the test system has not metabolic um, capacity added. However, as with the DPRA, um, the majority of pre and pro tens are sufficiently well identified. Um, as the NRF2 pathway is also a chemical stress pathway, uh, substances that induced uh, chemical stress by other means than sensitization may lead to um, false positive results. And also um, it has been reported that phytoestrogens and other substances in interfering with the luciferase enzyme um, may, may also uh, have an interference in the assay. Um, and, and this is also clear from, from the reaction mechanism, um, acylating agents may be underpredicted in, in those two methods. So looking at the uh, dendritic cell activation assays, um, addressing the third key event, um, I will focus here on the HCLAT, which is the human cell line activation test. Um, and in this assay, um, the changes in expression of the cell surface markers CD86 and CD54 uh, um, are measured uh, using flow cytometry um, in the um, human cell line THP1. Um, it is important to note that the guideline states that the cells have to be obtained from the American um, cell bank. Um, as it is known that cells from different cell banks may um, result in different results in, in the assay. So that's um, important to note. Um, and as, as, as of today, um, there is a limitation in the guideline uh, for, again, for, for log KO, KOW. Um, and so substances above 3.5 um, resulting in, in a negative result um, should currently be um, yeah, predicted to be inconclusive, but that's under discussion in the ongoing revision. Um, and uh, it is proposed, and this will be discussed in the coming weeks, um, but currently it is discussed that if a substance is negative and has a, a log KOW above 3.5 and no cytotoxicity uh, should be interpreted as inconclusive. Um, but if cytotoxicity is observed or a positive result is obtained, um, this should be accepted. Um, the information on multi-constituent substances and mixtures um, is, is rather limited, um, but the test is technically applicable. So there, like for, for the lucents and uh, keratinocents assays, it's possible to work uh, with substances with no defined molecular weight. Um, also like for, for the um, 442D methods, um, the test is applicable to soluble substances as well as those that form stable dispersions. And as mentioned for the other system as well, um, there's again limited metabolic capability, um, but the majority of pre and pro hub tens aren't sufficiently well identified. As the readout in the flow cytometry is fluorescent, um, substances that are fluorescent um, may, may interfere with the detection methods. And as promised, um, here's some more detail about the uh, metabolic capacity of the assays. So we know that uh, around about one fourth of the sensitizing substances are pre or pro hub tens. So pre hub tens that are those that have um, that are activated by air oxidation, for example, or auto oxidation. 
and prooptans are those that need active um, metabolism. So, and uh, sometimes it's not easy to differentiate between the two, so that's why we usually report those with a with a um, yeah flash. Um, and it has been shown that around about 90% of the pre and prooptans are correctly uh, predicted in by the in vitro methods. And there has been an um, exam workshop uh, which then re resulted in the publication by um, Grace Padlevitz et al. in 2016. So all those OECD methods have um, yeah, protocols available online. Um, it needs to be known that the, yeah, the test methods as such um, need to be um, integrated in, in a defined approach. Um, since the negative predictions cannot be used on their own to uh, conclude on the absence of skin sensitization. Um, also, um, skin sensitizing potency cannot be currently not be assessed by the individual methods. Um, and just to mention a few more words about uh, reach. Um, so, well, the the information requirements were, were updated and we have a guidance uh, document on that. Um, so they, the in vitro methods have to be used. Um, however, the animal t test is still needed. Um, for example, if something is not applicable because it's out of the applicability domain, um, or for example, the in vitro results are not clear cut and additional information is needed. Um, in that guidance, um, a scheme is presented um, that that um, yeah discusses how how to um, to do this assessment majorly based on a weight of evidence approach. Um, so as long as we have sufficient information for um, hazard classification, that can be done. Um, otherwise, we would uh, continue testing. So now uh, talking about the uh, defined approaches and, and OECD. Um, so in the last years, there have been uh, several guidance documents by, by the OECD. Um, and I think the most important thing is to understand that um, a defined approach is, um, is consisting of a fixed data interpre interpretation, in, sorry, interpretation procedure. Um, and um, yeah, we will discuss this in the in in the next slides as well. Um, the guidance has six defined principles. Um, so we need to de define which endpoint is being addressed, um, what purpose it is for, um, we, a description for the underlying rationale, including the mechanistic basis, is needed. Um, the individual information sources need to be described. Um, and also how the ind individual information sources are processed. Um, and um, also very important, we need to consider the uh, known uncertainties of, of the methods. And as an appendix to the guidance document 256, um, there is a list um, of defined approaches, and which are called case studies here. Um, that combine different information sources uh, for either um, skin sensitizing potency or hazard information. Uh, and you can see here um, we have the, our, our strategy is listed here with a weight of evidence, uh, num number seven. Um, and we will also hear some, some words about other strategies in the following. So um, the two out of three uh, has, for hazard identification strategy um, is combining three endpoints of the adverse outcome pathway, so key events. So we're looking at protein regativity addressed by the DPRA, keratinocyte activation by leucines or keratinocyte assays, and the activation of dendritic cells um, by, by the H class. Um, the results of any of the two of the three tests determine the overall um, results, so it's a majority vote. And we have um, in the first publication by Caroline Bauch in, in 2012 um, obtained a 94% um, accuracy. So this was then followed uh, in another publication in a larger data set uh, with 213 substances, um, which came out with a similar good um, productivity. So in this slide, we have, uh, first of all, the comparison to the local lymph node assay, um, having uh, 
just about 80% accuracy, but if we compare to human data, which is the endpoint that we really want to address, uh, we end up with a 90% um, accuracy. And then there's um, additional additional work has been done um, in collecting more data by Nicole Kleinstreyer. Um, and they have assessed 127 substances and have obtained similar uh, good productivities in around about 80 80%. Um, so the two out of three approach is, is based on the um, AOP. It's for hazard identification um, and it also provides mechanistic data. And generally, um, it achieves slightly better productivities than the local lymph node assay um, in comparison to the human data. Um, the limitations of the individual test methods of, of course apply, um, but um, in the combination, the assays can also complement each other. So if something is not applicable in one approach and um, the concurrent results are obtained in the two other approaches, um, there must still be a reliable prediction in, in the approaches. So um, there is another OECD project on the development of, a, of, a, of the test guideline on defined approaches. Um, and that's done on internationally agreed um, evaluation framework and that's actually work, work ongoing. Um, so the, the goal is to have not only the individual test methods, but uh, to also have this kind of defined approaches falling under the mutual acceptance of data. And the first draft guideline um, is now open for, for comments um, until um, ne next week. So um, it's all available via the OECD um, website. So you're all invited uh, to look at the documents and sub uh, submit your comments if you have any. Um, also, this guideline has a big uh, supporting document for the evaluation and re review of the draft guideline um, that also contains um, the, an evaluation of the LLNA uncertainty and reproducibility because um, as in for many in vitro sensitization test steps, the basis for, for comparison, so it's always compared to, to local lymph node assay, but we know that the local lymph node assay is not perfect uh, and that's why the LLNA uncertainty as well as the reproducibility is addressed in there. Um, of course, also um, uncertainty and reproducibility of the defined approaches are, um, are addressed in, in that document. Also, um, it is discussed the, the technical limitations in the applicability domain uh, as well as the chemical space coverage is discussed in, in that document. So um, to sum up, um, well, there has been some progress and the standard information requirement for REACH has been updated. Um, I mean, with the two out of three approach, we addressed the first three key events in the adverse outcome pathway. Um, and all methods are OECD adopted test methods. Um, however, we need to combine the methods in a defined approach um, to then be able to call something a sensitizer or, or non-sensitizer. And with the activities by OECD in the uh, future, it may be possible to, to have a full replacement. And um, also there's other methods in, in the pipeline that claim to be one-to-one -one replacement to the local lymph node assay, uh, but so far that's not the case. Um, and lastly, um, the ongoing OECD activities aim to give uh, the DAs the same rec regulatory recognition as the animal test. And uh, before you, I, I show you a slide with my references. Um, I, oh no, I have the slide with the references here. Yeah, um, I, I'd like to mention um, we have an um, intensive training course upcoming um, in the week after next week. It's a hands-on training, um, including the um, in vitro methods presented, uh, but also the assessment of data and um, testing strategies. And um, it is, um, well, it's an, it's a live seminar, uh, but there's also a possibility to join in by, by, by WebEx. So if you're interested in more details, um, you, you're welcome to join. And I'll just switch back to the references. Uh, that's a non-exhaustive list, um, but uh, providing some more details um, on, on the approaches. So with that, I'd like to, to end my part of the presentation. 
and uh, thank you very much for um, your audience. Thank you, Susanna. Um, if anyone has questions for Susanna, um, please hold them for now, and we'll open up time for discussion with both of the speakers after our next talk. So speaking next will be Taku Nishijo, and it is around midnight in Japan, so a special thank you to him for joining us so late today. Um, Taku's background is in science and engineering, and he's worked at Cal Corporation for the past five years with one of his focus areas on skin sensitization testing. And his talk today will be on Cal's sequential testing strategy. Yeah. And we can see your slides whenever you're ready. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah, okay. Thank you for introducing my, about me. And uh, I am Taku Nishijo, working at Cal Corporation in Japan for development uh, non animal testing strategy of skin sensitization. And thank you for this opportunity to make a presentation about our sequential testing strategy approach, which is called as SDS. Today, at first, I will talk about the topics about key events of allergic contact dermatitis and uh, operational summary and the limitations of DPRA and HBAT. This part will be a repetition and a review of Suzanne's uh, presentation. And subsequently, I will talk about a sequential testing strategy with DPRA and HBAT, and in particular, about its predictor performance, limitation, and uncertainty. So as you know, allergic contact dermatitis is a derailed type hypersensitivity reaction of the skin caused by contact with uh, skin sensitizing substances. Allergic contact dermatitis consists of two phases, an um, initial sensitization phase in which the immune system is primed a subsequent irritation phase in which the clinical response is initiated. And skin sensitization is considered to be one of the key human health endpoints of safety assessment ingredient uh, comprising cosmetic or medicine. Skin sensitization is a result of a complex manufacturing sequence of events to cause skin sensitization, a chemical must penetrate into the skin and the form conjugate with protein. Then, dendritic cells in the skin become activated by the conjugate and migrate into the draining lymph node, where dendritic cells induce the proliferation and antigen specific T cells. After that, Activation and proliferation of antigen-specific T cells is occurred. Thus, several key events are required to acquisition of skin sensitization. Non-animal testing methods for skin sensitization have been developed by focusing on these key events of the adverse outcome pathway called as AOP. There are four key events, protein binding, keratinocyte activation, dendritic cells activation, and fluorification of antigen-specific T cells at the AOP for skin sensitization defined by the OECD. And uh, today topics, SDS, is developed for prediction of uh, skin sensitization potential and potency of a tested chemical using two test methods addressing key event one and three in OECD AOP. Key event one uh, of reactivity of chemical with protein is evaluated using the DPRA direct peptide reactivity assay, which has been accepted as an OECD test guideline 442C. 
And the key event tree of activation of dendritic cells by chemicals is evaluated using the human cell line activation test, HQUAT, which has been accepted as OECD test guideline 442E. In this SDS, the assay related to key events 2 is not included, but DPRS sustained depletion and keratin cells covering key events 2 are mechanistically relevant. This point has been reported by Joanna in 2013. The key molecular pathway induces the keratin cells corresponding to cysteine reactivity with a KIP1 sensor protein. In addition, the NA, NRFC activation is induced by sensitizers and not by non-sensitizer in THP1 cells and could function as a, one of the danger signals to lead the phenotypic alternation of THP1 cells. Thus, there is a mechanistic lesionate the DPRA and HQAT could be linked to, to the key event too. Here, I'd like to talk about a brief operational summary of in vitro test methods. That of the DPRA is shown here. In this set, we incubate each test compound at a specified molecular weight ratio with cysteine or rising model peptide for 24 hours and analyzes non-reactive peptides by SPLC. And the positive criteria is that average depletion score formula is uh, greater than 6.376%. Uh, Next, the brief operational summary of HQAT is shown here. Uh, THP1 cells were treated uh, with a test chemical for 20 hours at concentration based on the predetermined CV75. This is a concentration yielding 75% cell viability and stained with a fluorescent rubbed antibody for CD86 or CD54 and measured a uh, fluorescence intensity of these cell surface markers expression by fluorocytometry to calculate if the relative fluorescence intensity uh, RFY compared to the BQ control. The possible criteria is uh, greater than 150% over CD86 RFY and lower greater than the 200% of CD54 RFY in at least two of three independent experiments. If either criteria is met, test compound is regarded as a positive, otherwise negative. From the double dependency curves of three experiments, the medium concentration inducing 150% of CD86 RFY or 200% of uh, CD54 RFY is calculated at EC150 or EC200, like uh, EC3 value determination in the LLMA. The resulting lower EC value is defined as a minimal I induction threshold called as MIT. Please note that the sensitizing potency in HQAT is determined based on MIT value. The predictive performance of DPRA and HQAT for the 139 chemical is summarized in this table. In HQAT, uh, 82 of 102 sensitizers were detected as positive, and 26 of 37 non sensitizers were detected as negative. Thus, the accuracy of HQAT was 78%, uh, 
the sensitivity was 80% and the specificity was a 70%. And in the DPR way, 74 of uh, 102 sensitizers were detected as positive and 28 of 37 non sensitizer were detected as negative. Thus, the accuracy of DPR way was 73%. The sensitivity was 73%, the specificity was as, uh, 75%. HQRAT and DPRA show the relatively high sensitivity and specificity respectively regarding the 139 analyzed test chemicals. Predictivity of moderate and weak sensitizer can be improved by the complementary combination with h current and DPRA. For this point, several integrated testing strategy, ITS, that use multiple test methods, including a two out of three approach by bus, have been activated, developed because one single test method is insufficient to cover the AOP and to have high accuracy as reported by OECD in 2016. And, uh, okay, next slide. Is, uh, this is a brief summary of in vitro test methods for procedure exposure condition and limitation. As I talked, in DPRA, test chemical is incubated with model peptide at a specified molecular ratio ratio, and non-reacted peptide is analyzed by HPLC. DPRA has some limitations for lipophilic chemicals, preproheptant, chemicals having unknown molecular weights, and chemicals having the same retention time as a model peptide. Perhaps they need to be a, a through auto-oxidation activated to other sensitizer before coming into contact with the skin or on the skin itself. Perhaps they need to be a metabolically activated to act as a sensitizer within the skin. And uh, in h grad THP1 cells were treated with uh, test chemicals for 24 hours at a concentration based on the predetermined CV75 and uh, stained with a fluorescent rubber antibodies for cell surface markers. Changes in CD86 and CD54 expression induced by the test chemicals are then measured by the fluorocytometry. HCAT also has some limitation for lipophilic chemicals with a low KOW greater than the 3.5 or preprohaptent. And the strong fluorescence chemicals emitting at the same wavelengths as FITC or as a propidium I iodide will interfere the full cytometric detection and thus cannot be correctly evaluated by h -grad. And it should be mentioned that the definition of limitation of lipophilic chemicals in OECD test guideline is now under revision and reviewed. This is a limited description. The h grad method is applicable to test chemicals, soluble or that form stable depression in appropriate solvent or big codes. Test chemicals with low KOW greater than the 3.5 tend to produce false negative result. However, if cytotoxicity uh, this means uh, cell viability is uh, less than 90% observed with the uh, test chemicals with low KOW greater than 3.5 is reached at maximum soluble test concentrations. Cri criteria for negatively can be applied. If negative result 
is observed with the test chemical with a local W greater than the 3.5 and non cytotoxicity is reached, the result should be considered as in sorry, inconclusive. And the positive result obtained with the test chemicals with a local W greater than the 3.5 could still be used to support the identification of the test chemical as a skin sensitizer. In general, monoconstituent substances with a high local W may be insoluble in the exposure medium. However, if stability or stable dispersion can be obtained as a documented, testing may be still conducted. And uh, next, I will talk about the sequential testing strategy with DPRA and HQRT. Um, we have been developed two approaches for non-animal testing battles. In integrated testing strategy, ITS, we assign scores to outcomes in each single test and integrated the scores for the best predictivity based on the previously proposed concept. In addition, we also developed the stepwise system uh, weighting the evidence for HQRT and DPRA with 139 chemical dataset, which is called a uh, sequential testing strategy. Today's topic is a STS approach. And the STS straightforward decision tree based on the quantitative data from a uh, in chemical assay addressing the increasing chemical reactivity and in vitro assay addressing capacity to induce dendritic cell activation. This approach predicts three LLNA potency classes, strong, weak, and non-sensitized. We determined HGRAT as a first step for STS due to higher sensitivity and accuracy than DPRA based on the data set of 139 chemicals. The positive result of HGRAT were classified as strong or weak potency based on the cutoff of MIT value 10 microgram per milliliter. Then, to avoid false negative result for weak and moderate sensitizers, we determined DPRA as a second step. The positive result in DPRA were classified as a weak potency regardless of the average depletion score. If negative in both tests, the test chemical was considered not classified. The predicted performance for hazard identification of STS for the 139 chemicals is summarized in this table. In the STS, uh, 92 of 102 sensitizers were detected as positive and 20 of 37 non sensitizer were detected as negative. Accuracy of h -grad was 81%, sensitivity was 90%, and the specificity was 54%. Thus, it is indicated that STS has high sensitivity but relatively low specificity. In addition, it should be mentioned that the 10 chemicals with sensitizing potential were false negatives in SDS. The predictive performance for potency clarification of SDS for the same data set is summarized in this table. 19 of 29 sensitizers which are classified as extreme or strong in LRNA were detected as strong in STS clarification. 57 of 73 sensitizers, which are classified as moderate or weak in LRNA, 
were detected as weak in STS classification. Accuracy of STS for these three RNA potency classes was 69%. The overprediction rate was 17%, and the underprediction rate was 14%. Thus, it is indicated that STS has a high predict performance for potency classification. Next, we examine the performance in predicting human hazard. We use the human potency categorization system reported by Basketer in 2014. This system is based on the combination of direct human induction such as HRIPT and preliminary induction data with human clinical data, such as a dia sorry, diagnostic patch test. In STS, accuracy versus human was 80%, sensitivity was 98%, and the specificity was 41%. And for potency classification, accuracy of the three human potency classes was 64%. On the other hand, in LLNA, accuracy versus human was 74%, the sensitivity was 85%, and the specificity was 50%. And for potency classification, accuracy for potency class was uh, 59%. Thus, predict performance of STS is uh, comparable to that of LLNA for human hazard identification and human potency classification. And the limitation on individual test method are mentioned in the first part. Based on that, chemical is that fall outside the applicability domains of DPRA and HCRT cannot be applicated to STS. STS, technical elimination for lower uh, water soluble chemicals for DPRA, test chemicals should soluble in appropriate solvent such as acetonitrol or water. And uh, for HCRT, Test chemicals should be soluble or form stable dispersion in DMSO or serine. And STS also have substance-related limitation for pre or prehaptens, might not be reliably predicted due to lack of metabolic capacities in both DPRA and HGRAT. When information from the different individual data sources is integrated in STS, this limitation can be minimized and the STS can lead to correct classification of uh, pre or prohaptin and uh, raw water soluble chemicals. And uh, to use STS, we need to consider the uncertainties of it. First, key event for of T cell activation is not included due to lack of available test methods. Second, the STS covers key event one and three of AOP and is based on the data set of 139 chemicals. The confidence in the prediction of hazard identification is high when similar chemicals are available in this data set and the limitations are taken into account. Finally, there has been already mentioned as a one slide ago, the confidence is lower for chemicals with low water solubility and lower uh, for preprohaptin due to the limited metabolic capacities of test chemicals. And uh, one final note is that the uh, data interpretation procedure in STS, in order to identify skin sensitizing potential, the conservative decision is conducted by uh, waiting one positive result in individual assay. 
conservative decision approach using DPRA and HBAT versus using three assays, DPRA, keratinocytes, and HBAT could be compared to identify skin synthesis potential in the report used, uh, sorry, in the report by us in last year. But it was found that this approach using three assets only slightly improved sensitivity and uh, markedly delete specificity. And uh, there is a main reference for SDS. And this is summary. SDS uses uh, quantitative data from uh, DPRA and HQUAT. In SDS, tested chemical, which is positive by either DPRA or HQUAT, is judged as a sensitizer. The strong class in the HQUAT is available to predict strong sensitizer in LRNA. Either the weak class in HQUAT or positive result in DPRA is available to predict weak sensitizer in LRNA. And STS has high predict performance, which is comparable to LRNA for human hazard identification. However, we need to consider the lower confidence for chemicals with lower water solubility or preprohaptens. And that brings me to the end of my presentation. Thank you for very thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Taku. Um, yeah. Before we move into the discussion, I quickly wanted to point out that we tentatively have our second webinar in this series planned for January of 2019 on inhalation toxicity testing. So please do stay tuned for more details and a date for that webinar. 